ultra endurance racing, 80 to 90% mental and the rest is physical. If you want to make things happen, you can make things happen. For me, nothing is impossible. Which is known as the toughest bicycle race in the world. She became the first female to win it in its 39 year history. I think when you want to do something, just stop talking about it and just do it. Qualifying race, I set a new woman's record. 80, 85 kilometers an hour. It was getting dangerous for me. If one person goes down, it's like a domino effect. I mean, I lost my lips, clavicle broken, my ribs, my hips, both my legs, my arms, fingers, toes. But it was unquestionable that I'd never race again. I got back on the bike, you know, not three years later, four years later, that following season. On today's show, I talk never giving up with the badass endurance athlete, Leah Goldstein. Leah, you have had a remarkable career. As a teenager, you got obsessed with kickboxing, became a world champion. Then you spend nine years in the Israeli commandos and secret police. You become a Krav Maga instructor for the elite commandos. Then you get into cycling and you start to race across America. Mm -hmm. You win the race across America. You have done some crazy impressive things. And through it all, it seems that there's one trait that ties it all together. It's your never quit attitude. When did you first learn that this was your real superpower? I just think, again, from experience as a young child, right? I mean, I had these things that I wanted to do in Taekwondo. I wanted to be a junior, you know, national champion, kickboxing. I wanted to be a world champion in the IDF. I wanted to, you know, join base eight, the military intelligence base and be a commando instructor. You know, I want to work for a branch of, 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 uh, of intelligence in the military and cycling. I wanted to be a pro cyclist. I wanted to do race across America. All those things I had planned and I did it. And I said, I don't care how long it takes. I mean, my hardest stint in life was, of course, my pro racing where it took me eight years to get to where I wanted to go to. And it was the hardest part of my life because a lot of things kind of really came easy to me. Remember, when I came into pro racing, I was 30 years old. They said I was basically too old. I'd missed the boat, didn't have the right mentality, you know, that it would never happen to me. Too big to be a climber too small to be a sprinter oh god you name it right you know so I had to prove to this organization you know the Canadian cycling organization at first like you know who I really am and with the past experiences of up until that point you know I went through a hard, lot of hardships but it, it just took me a little bit longer like I said it doesn't matter how long it takes you got to get to your finish line no matter what it takes I mean even for me it was I had a plan of doing it four years and then going into race across America but it took me eight years almost ten years right and then when I got to that point the 2005 crash happened you know you get to the peak of your career and then boom in 30 seconds everything is gone you don't know if you'll ever walk again or if your life will be the same so I had those major peaks but I had those major drops as well where I completely hit rock bottom and coming out of that just made me that much stronger that for me nothing is impossible if you want to make things happen you can make things happen it depends how much you believe in yourself right and i believe in myself that the things that i want to do i will find a way and i will make it happen and you started off by saying that you, that this was learned if we go back to kickboxing right you decide mm -hmm. that you're going to leave taekwondo and go into kickboxing during the 80s it was incredibly unknown it was incredibly dangerous mm -hmm. my understanding is you didn't even tell your parents that you were kind of making this switch so is kind of step 1 in in your secret sauce to success to just like to decide that you want something and then to not listen to other people because you just don't tell them, you just go off and start doing it? Like in, in that time, I, mean, I was a kid, right? So I think it's just more, my father didn't want his little girl going to eat Hastings Street in Vancouver, which sounded the best part of town, into a grungy boxing studio, right? Because back then, like you said, the sport was very new. There was a lot of mixed matches, right? You know, promoters would bring in opponents that were twice your weight or your size. And because, you know, people like to see the blood in the ring, right? You know, so it was a very dangerous sport in that respect, as you don't know who you're going to come up against. You're, you're being told you're going to fight somebody you know 120 140 pounds and they end up being 220 pounds right you know so in that respect it was dangerous you know for for a teenager but I mean the passion I had for it was so strong that it didn't matter what anyone said I was gonna do it I think when you want to do something just stop talking about it and just do it right because you know we do this a lot we make noise but we're not really saying anything right and yeah. that was kind of my motto is when you choose to do something don't start yesterday start like right as soon as you make that decision you start right now right? And then you're just lasered in and you get to your finish line no matter what it takes. And I think if you live with that prospect, right, then anything you do will come easier and you'll make anything happen. 
But again, like I said, your biggest support system is you and you have to rely on yourself and nobody else. So I, I've heard you say that you left the the Israeli special forces or whatever department you happened to be in at the time, but that you left because the danger just became too great and the risk became too great with the death of different team members and other things. Is that kind of the top level threshold where you start to look around and go, I have I have hit the point now where it's just so darn risky, yeah. I should move on to the next thing? Yeah, that's a good point. Absolutely. Yeah. I think there is a reality there, right? You know, I mean, again, I do the things that I love to do, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> I mean, I want to live, right? With the different assignments that I was put on and, and the position that I was in, because the country is so small, it was getting dangerous for me anyways, right? And they kept having to reposition me to do different things, you know? So I think when your life is in danger, like, you know, it changes you as a person, right? And especially in that, in that, that was my job, right? You know, so it was, it was the right time just to leave, right? Same with, you know, you have to make those smart decisions, right? Then Another good example is kickboxing. I was world champion at 17. You get hit in the noggle a lot, right? You know, and even if I won all my fights, it's the training. And I didn't want to end up with a brain injury or whatever when I was 25 or 30 or whatnot. And who knows what's going to happen. And with people that do high risk stuff, you have to come to realization that that's the end of a chapter. And I think with everything I've done, I've kind of ended it at the right point, you know, not only because I've, I reached the peak of whatever I wanted to do, but for safety reasons as well. Like even now, if the doctor would say, I, I do have an issue with my little ticker here to what happened in Race Across America and I've gone to testing and if doctors were to say you know what you're doing is stupid and it's gonna you know potentially end your life hey you know what my life is more important than the racing. So, you know, you have to sometimes come to reality of whatever you're doing and, and you make the right decisions, right? So yes, for the things that I've, why I exited a lot of the things I had to do, like I said, a good point is because it was life-threatening. So during the time when you were transitioning from the police force into cycling, you said that you were actually out in the Middle East and it wasn't quite that competitive. And so you get this natural boost where you're like really good right away. And then you come to another market where suddenly you realize, oh, I'm not as good as I thought I was. The competition's much stronger. It's much stricter. What do you, how, how does your brain process this new challenge, right? Because again, like so many things, I think a lot of us would go like, oh, I thought I was good at this. I guess I'm not what's the point? And you're like, oh, hell no, there is a point. Just wait, just see how good I could be. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, listen, I was a national champion in Israel and duathlon, but I was a big fish in a small pond, right? I mean, I come to North America, I'm a shrimp in an ocean, right? You know, and it was an eye opener for me of, holy crap, you're not that good. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> but that can't but feel good, really- right? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, like, listen, the first, like the category for the first years of racing, I was, cause I could rely on my fitness, right? You know, I was very fit, but once you hit the pro levels of racing, you know, it becomes more strategic. Cycling is more like a chess game. You have to use your noodle. It's like, you know, you have to think three moves before you make your own moves. And it's not a matter of just being fit. It's knowing the terrain, knowing other riders, knowing the conditions. And it's very much a team sport. It's not an individual sport. You know, I didn't know I came from the Middle East. There was no, I was due at do athlete thinking I'm going to be this pro racer in North America, right? So you learn really fast. You know, when I started racing, Mark, I'd come and do these races and I'd come in so last. I wouldn't <laughs> even know where the finish was. I'd say, everybody's gone. Like, there's no banner, nothing. I'd see my car in an empty parking lot and go, okay, damn, this must be it, right? And that's how I got into racing, right? And it wasn't once or twice. It was many times where, you know, I go, Sh- <laughs> this is some fun, but you learn, right? Okay, be patient, be smart, like know who to follow. You start to know the riders, you know, get a coach. So you start to learn from your mistakes, right? But it was humiliating. I mean, pro cycling really taught me, you know, what the human body is capable of doing because with everything I had done in my life, nothing kicked me more physically or mentally than the damn bike. But it really did make me stronger because it was the first time that I really had to work hard to achieve something. Whereas before, not that I, you know, didn't work hard, but I just excelled really fast fast but sure it didn't happen with cycling though yeah so eight nine years for you to train your way through to the road of america i i I forget the the ram right so for all of those days three thousand miles over 11 days i think no actually you have 12 days to do it right that's okay that that's the cutoff we actually had planned on doing it because there's records right you know for the long course the women's courses is, is 10 days So that was our plan kind of going into race across America. But, you know, for, I think for solo racers, the percentages of people who actually make the 12 days, it's very low. I think it's like 20 or 30%. You're you're taking on something where the best of the best 
take it on. And of the best of the best, very few finish. And this is a question that I'm sure you were asked time and time again, but it's, it's so fascinating that I can't help but ask it. I always ask endurance athletes, when it's two or three in the morning, when you're starting to hallucinate, when, you know, when, you, when you're not feeling great, you know that it's just like you could have sleep, you could have warmth, you could have food, you could, you could stop all the pain from hurting, like you could just give up. What is it that you tell yourself just as the seconds slowly tick by and it just never <laughs> ends. What do you tell yourself? Well, when we talk about Race Across America, I mean, it's a completely different beast from anything else. You know, most ultra races are about 500, 600 miles, which is about like 800 kilometers. Race Across America is 5,000. Don't forget, it's 5,000 K. The clock doesn't stop ticking. So in a, you know, in a 24 hour period, you're only sleeping between zero to two and a half, three hours at the most, right? So you have to know what your body is going to go through. And I learned that as a pro racer, because I was always better the longer the race is like, you know, in, in, in Europe, for example, when we do the Grand Bucolic race called, it's called the Tour de France for women. I excelled at the end, the end of the race where I started getting better and I didn't need the 10 hours or, you know, eight hours sleep that most racers would. Sometimes I would, you know, would be so hyped up and you know energetic I'd have three hours of sleep so I realized that I would excel very fast when I would make that transition into ultra endurance racing so I came in there I think with with a little bit of benefit because of that because on my first qualifying race which was race across Oregon I set a new woman's record and that was prior to getting hit by a car and breaking both my arms in Redlands California I had two compound fractures and that was three no five weeks before that race so I thought to myself damn if I can do this barely having arms you know being under trained not knowing you know about mental endurance racing or whatever then I would excel and I knew I would and that's kind of how the whole thing started right with the ultra endurance racing is just doing that first race and you know saying, okay, I've got, I'm more gifted for this type of racing than I was for pro racing. We've had Navy SEALs on We Do Hard Things and something in Leia's story that reminds me of all of the SEALs I've spoken to, the SEALs who have to go through Hell Week, who have to go through the training. It's not the physicality that gets them. It's not whether they're super built or super brave or super strong. It's all what happens up here. They know that if they give up, they will regret this forever. And so I think that so many of us are trained to be a victim. So many of us are trained to give up when things get hard. So many of us don't have the grit that the seals have or Leia has. And so I'm curious, I want to know from Leia, what is it about the way she approaches these challenges? What is it that she knows that those of us who give up do not? You know what? Here's a good point. If you're doing something and then you quit and you regret it, then you did have a passion for it. But if you quit and you don't care about it, you don't think about it, then it was never meant to be. That's what I believe in, right? So, you know, it's okay to quit something and, and whatever, but if it's still nagging at you in your head and you're still thinking about it, then you got to get your ass back to where you were and finish up whatever you were doing. And that's the difference. I think a lot of times we do things that eh, we don't really want to do it. And so quitting is not a big deal. You don't think about it. But when it does haunt you at night, then there's a reason why it does. And it always will haunt you if you don't go back and do it. And quitting is the worst feeling in the world when you regret it, that regret feeling of whatever. But remember, you can turn it around. You have the ability to turn around. So why wouldn't you do that? And I think oh, that's what that's you have so to great. focus on, right? But listen, sometimes you have to try multiple things before you find that one thing that really fires you up. So it's okay. You know what I mean? It's not really quitting. It's just kind of exploring other avenues. But eventually you will come across something that go, wow, you know what? This is me. And that's what you got to hang on to. That's what I'm saying is trying new things. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Be out there. Try, do everything you can now. Do everything possible. Never say no. Oh, you're getting me all jazzed up here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I can't wait to, to go to go do my hit exercise right after this. Uh, so there, there is this thing that I've that I've watched with others and I've noticed in myself. When you can reprogram your brain to receive a signal. Let's say it's it's let's say that I'm on a cut and and I'm really hungry. That could either be, well, I'm on a cut and I'm hungry and so I want to go eat, or it could be like, ooh, I'm on a cut and I'm hungry. That means that that I'm I'm locked into a good zone. What signals have you kind of been able to to train yourself to? Whether this is you know, and we're speaking about overcoming fear, and I imagine you've done a lot of this work where those signals that that you would normally start to question, instead you're like, oh. 
I'm, I'm doing the right thing here because of it. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that depends because there's a lot of things going through your mind when you're in the middle of the night, you're hallucinating, you're tired, you want to go to sleep, right? But I train very hard. That gives me the confidence to know that I've come to the starting line in the best shape possible and I did my homework. So that already gave me confidence, right? But in something like a, you know, a 12 day race, I knew that if I would have quit at any time, I would regret it for the rest of my life or I could suck it up, be in pain for a short period of time and say, at least I did it. So I would choose that opposed to that right and that's a lot of times that's a good point too is the purpose of why you're there and you got to think about the hard work you put into doing in order to get to that starting line and I mean of course it's going to be difficult every race is difficult anything that anybody does is going to be difficult right but like I said you got to make it to your finish line no matter what even I tell new ram riders that even if they don't make the 12-day cutoff still get across still finish the race because you can still finish it right and come back the following year or the year after and do it again because mentally you'll know what to expect earlier in the conversation Leia mentioned that she had a crash you know she breaks both her arms and then and then weeks later she's racing again she wins and it's a huge boost of confidence if she could win with broken arms and not trained she's awesome but she actually had a huge devastating crash that almost cost her her entire career a crash that was so severe that it not only left her hospitalized, but the doctors told her she would never race again. I was finally kind of, um, I had reached the level of racing where I wanted to reach it. I was climbing, like, probably one of the best climbers in the world at that point. You know, I could race with the best. I had opportunities to race for a big U US team or a big, you know, a European team. So I wanted to do one more race, kind of to test my abilities as a climber and make my final decision, right? I mean, this was, I was on top of the world. I finally got to this point. So I went to, you know, to Bend, Oregon. It's called Cascade Classic. It was a three-day race. And, you know, on the first stage of a three-day race, I went, you know, I, I climbed this mountain with, with Kirsten Armstrong and Ina Tutenberg. And I was the only rider who could hold that pace, kind of going up this mountain. Like, yes, you know, I categorized myself as a climber. Then we start descending. And as we're descending, more riders are starting to catch up with us. And, you know, in pro racing, I mean, if I do this, I'm touching the rider beside me. We're very close for the draft effect. So all of a sudden on my left hand side, this rider tried to come in and she didn't want to touch the center line because it would have given her a penalty. So instead she leaned into me and we're going about 80, 85 kilometers an hour. She leans into me. I lose control of my bike and I end up landing on my face. Whoop, instant face. If I mean, I lost my lips, clavicle broken, my ribs, my hips, both my legs, my arms, fingers, toes. You know, from the friction of the fall, all this first layer of skin, my torso ripped off. Me surviving, that was a miracle because there was no way I thought, I, I mean, I was coming in out of consciousness as I was lying there thinking, I'm done. I'm not coming out of this. And I remember I started saying sorry to my parents and whatnot. And it was horrifying. I remember kind of coming in out of consciousness, trying to hold pieces of my kind of my face that were hanging, right? You know, the diagnosis wasn't good. They said it was questionable about my ability to walk properly without a walker or a cane but it was unquestionable that I'd never race again. That's what I was told. And as soon as I woke up from surgery, because I had to have a lot of surgery done, my face, my body, you know, whatnot. I mean, I basically said to myself, I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to get back on my bike. I'm going to race again. And I'm going to come back even stronger than I did before all this crap happened, right? Because I worked too damn but, hard. But what what was it within you? Is it just like, an, is it is it like a, a, a dogged determination? Is it something to prove to yourself or to others? Like, like what is the thing that fuels that ridiculous fire? I didn't like what I was hearing. I said, damn it, I crashed. I get out of this. You know what I mean? That's a no. The first thing I did is I moved my, okay, good. I mean, I'm not paralyzed. So that's a good thing, right? You know, but nothing else. I mean, no negativity p passed my mind, right? You know, I just stayed positive. Like I said, I mean, I started my recovery. The only thing I could do at that point was contract my abs. So I was bed bound. I couldn't do anything else. Everything else was broken. So I started contracting my abs. And every day I did something more today that I couldn't do the day before. Like three days into the hospital, I requested a wheelchair. And the only thing I could do is I could barely move it like, like 10 meters. I had a little bit of use of my left arm, hand, I should say, and my, um, my right ankle. And so I could move it a tiny bit. And I would work so hard to move it you know like even 10 meters I'd fall asleep I'd wake up and then I'd go another 11 meters and then and then 20 and then 50 and then I was reeling around the you know so every day and you see that motivation that progression and as hokey as this may sound is being in that positive mode 
I could feel my body starting to bind because I believed that I was going to come out of this, right? And I think that's what lifted me. Mind you too, I had more bad days than I did good days, but I didn't hang on to that. My goal, I only had one goal, and that was to get out of the hospital, get my body back into shape, get my mind kind of, because it was a flashback, so it was hard for the recovery, and start racing again and continue where I had left off. And that's what I was focused on. I wasn't focused on anything else. I really want to kind of humanize this. So you said more bad days than good days. I feel like we just heard the good days. What were the bad days? What were you telling yourself? I mean, I was in pain all the time. I mean, breathing, blinking, too much light, too much sound, right? You know, because everything, all of it. I mean, when you're in that much, when your body is that, you know, broken and, and you know, and, and uh, traumatized, it's going through a lot. It was It was being in constant pain all the time. You know what I mean? And just not being able to move. And that that was the worst part because you were never comfortable. I could never be in a comfortable position or whatnot, you know. So those were the hard days, right? I mean, I had some days, you know, where I, I felt better. And remember, I mean, seriously, I was rock bottom at that point. It was not a good situation. But I never, ever remember saying to myself, man, this is my destiny. This is what's, this is what's going to happen. I'm just going to be stuck like this and God knows what's going to happen, right? I never, ever once went into that, you know, moment saying that that's going to that's going to be my end result. There's no way. What did you have to tell yourself or mentally prepare yourself for to get back on the bike, to get back into the draft, to get back into those moments where flashbacks and fear of another crash and and all of those things that your brain is probably screaming at you, you know, trying to protect you from being in that situation again. How did you prepare yourself to get back into it? The heart, like physically, my body started to heal really fast. Like doctors were floored at how fast things were starting to bind, right? Because I didn't just sit there and like not immobilize. I did a lot of activity to get those muscles working and the mobility and the range of motion and all that stuff, right? That wasn't the issue. Like you were saying, it was the flashbacks that were the hardest part, right? I mean, even when I was released from the hospital, I was able to drive per se, you know, even descending in my car, I noticed that I would start breaking right because then I would think about the flashbacks right and then same with with racing like you know when I got back on the bike and was able to ride outside my coach who you know years prior we were practicing more ascending now we were descending right you know we were he was trying to get me to feel comfortable without breaking so much you know what did that what did that look like was was that was that start small, inch your way up? Was it just like rip the bandaid off and go down the hill as fast as you can? Like, well, like how did you actually? Like, <laughs> I wish it was this. <laughs> no, we just did it multiple times. I mean, he saw how uncomfortable I was, but we did it repeatedly, repeated. You know, just you keep repeating it, repeating it, repeating it till it starts to feel more comfortable. Like it's always kind of there in the back of your head, but it's a matter of really being able to control it, right? Whereas before it would, you know, it would almost control me. Whereas now I can control it, right? You know, and I think it was just being repetitive with the things that I was doing. That was the biggest challenge, again, was being in that in that big group. But like I said, it's something that I don't think will ever go away, but it's a matter of me having more control of the mental strength part of that training is what w- would help me to get through and to come back on the bike. And mind you, I got back on the bike, you know, not three years later, four years later, that following season. It was less than a year where I was race ready and back on the bike. Do you like use affirmations? What do you use breathing when when you when you feel yourself? So you're descending. Let's say you're in a larger pack. You're in a larger group. The fear starts to surface. What do you do in those moments to help kind of separate it or calm it? I think it's more being aware of who I'm around, you know, and I do give myself a little bit more space. But listen, I mean, in pro racing, that's how it is, right? If one person goes down, it's like a domino effect. So there is a risk that you're taking. That's why later on when I had my second crash in Redlands, when I was hit by the car, I knew I had to retire from the sport because it's unavoidable. You can't say, okay, it doesn't matter how great of a rider you are. If it's some other one, you know, other person that's made a little mistake or bumped wheels or hit somebody else everyone's going down like you know again it's a domino effect right so there is a risk that you're taking and I realized the risk I said it'll never go away I had to deal with it for the next five years because I did race five years after that but it was difficult right you know but you know you make a choice and and again my choice at the end was after crashing you know a couple of times after that saying you know "Eh, it's it's a little bit too risky because there is life after cycling and I didn't want to be into the point where brain damage or whatever like your, your body can take so much. So I think that's why the transition into ultra endurance racing was a good fit at that time. 
And this is this is so interesting to me though because high achievers, especially you know our listeners and and people who have been able to even do a fraction of what you've been able to do, you have this. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to listen to what other people say. I'm going to make it happen type attitude. And so the idea of the white flag, the idea of giving up, the idea of of calling it quits, often I find high achievers hold on to things for too long. Mm-hmm. It's either the thing that defines you, in which case if I'm not doing this, gosh, what else could I be doing? Or uh, it's all you know, it's all you've ever done. There's something. You, you just don't want to quit. You don't want to be a quitter. You don't want to give up. You've been able to identify like, hey, high risk. I don't want to lose my life over this. But how do you, when when you realize that it's kind of time to move on, how do you approach picking what's next, deciding what's next, having this transition? Because again, I think so many people hold on to what was and they're afraid to step into what's next. Well, I mean, for me, things kind of just happened. Kind of, you know what I mean? I was introduced to things as I was doing one thing, right? Like when I retired from the Belouche, from the Secret Service, I wanted to be a pro racer. So it was kind of in the works as I was doing the other things, right? But I think too, the one principle that I follow too is I always like to try new things. You never know what you might find. I never thought in a million years I'd be a pro right racer when I was kickboxing, right? You know, or ultra endurance racing when I was in the military. Right. It just happened because I was trying new things. You love it. You fall in love with it. And a lot of careers happen that way. Right. You know, like a lot, a lot of the pro racers, they come from an, a skiing injury. Right. There's a, a number of U.S. racers. I can't remember off the top of my head. Now, Allison Powers was one of them. Right. Clara Hughes from ice skating to cycling. You know what I mean? So you discover things about yourself when you try new things and you're out there and you explore it. Right. And I think that was the one thing is I always had kind of goals set in mind and it opens other opportunities and you discover new things about yourself because everybody knows what they love to do, right? And you have to explore it. And I think that's really important in keeping people alive and motivated, you know, examples for other people to try things that they've never done before. And for me, that was one thing is, you know, exploring areas that I never thought about. And then I just started to fall in love with it. And I just kind of went from there. And isn't it a great thing that Leia chased her interests that she allowed her curiosity to carry her, that she tasted all these things, she tried all these things and then committed to the things that it fired her up the most. Because this year she won Race Across America, not in her age group, not in her gender. She won the whole thing. Race Across America this year, I came to the finish line and there's, I mean, there was thousands of people. It was insane. I didn't even know those people were there for me. And it was mostly mothers and their little daughters, right? You know, and I remember I was on the podium and this little girl, she's like eight years old and she kind of stops. I'm getting interviewed and she goes, you know, you're, you're my inspiration. Little eight year old girl, right? You know, so I think that kind of hit me when you see these little girls trying and seeing what women can do. That was actually life changing for me, right? Because it made me a little bit emotional, a little teary eyed or whatever, you know, because I didn't know what I did had such a big impact, right? You know, for, for many. And I had so many messages from women and mothers bringing their little girls and little boys even coming to, you you know, to the finish because I had never seen so many kids at a finish line before. So I think that was probably one of the most touching moments in my life with any of the athletic things that I have done was the impact that that finish had given to so many, so many young men and women. Because whether Leia realizes it or not, people are watching her. They're inspired by her story, by what she's done, by what she puts herself through. And here's the real question. What about you? What about your story? Who are you inspiring? Who's watching you?